How does your brain decide what something smells like? There's a chemical that makes your feet smell called isovaleric acid, also known as delphinic acid. A 2019 study found that it was highly stinky. But here's the question. If you took a whiff of it while reading the word cheese, do you think it would smell any different? And if so, do you think it would smell better or worse? When it was paired with the word cheese, people said isovaleric acid smelled way less stinky, more pleasant, and even more edible. But did it really smell different? Or did people just say it smelled less stinky and more cheesy because it was paired with the word cheese? We can't directly measure how something smells, but we can look inside the brain. We already know that labels affect the brain activity associated with smells and tastes. For instance, when you taste the same wine with a higher price tag, it increases activation in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with liking the wine more. So does that mean the more expensive wine tasted better? Not necessarily. The medial prefrontal cortex integrates a bunch of different kinds of signals together into a common currency of value. It combines information about how something tastes or smells with the way it's labeled and how much it costs. It even compares the pain of an electric shock with how much you'll get paid to get shocked. These prefrontal areas are downstream of the primary sensory areas. For smell, that's piriform cortex, which is the area that gets the most input from the olfactory bulbs. Different smells are associated with different patterns of activity in piriform cortex. The front of this area seems to track the physical structure of the molecules you're smelling whereas the back of it tracks how it smells to you, like how pleasant or edible it seems. So piriform cortex seems to transform this objective chemical information about odor molecules into a subjective perception of how something smells to you. But this area is so small and so tucked away in the human brain that it's really hard to study and we don't know that much about it. Piriform cortex was way more prominent in our rodent-like ancestors from 85 million years ago, and it makes up 10% of the whole cortex in some rodents. But in humans, it's too deep for EEG recordings on the scalp, and it's too small for most MRI machines to get a high-resolution recording. So this study used a super-powerful MRI scanner with a 7-tesla magnetic field. For comparison, junkyard magnets are about 1.5 tesla, and so are most hospital MRIs, although 3 tesla machines are becoming more common. The magnetic field in an MRI scanner lines up the random orientations of hydrogen protons in the brain. Then they send radio pulses to knock them over, and as the magnetic field snaps them back into place, they give off a signal that can be measured. A more powerful magnetic field means a stronger signal and higher resolution. In this case, 27 times higher than previous studies. MRI images are in 3D, so instead of pixels, they have voxels, volumetric pixels and each voxel was only one cubic millimeter. Rather than using the BO stench of isovaleric acid, they used the citrusy smells of citrol and limonene and the minty smells of menthol and eucalyptol. They had people sniff these chemicals while they were shown different words on screen to see if the words would change the pattern of activity in the piriform cortex itself before it gets mixed with other stuff in the medial prefrontal cortex. They used a technique called multivoxel pattern analysis, MVPA, where instead of just looking at how much activity there is, it looks for distinct patterns of activity across multiple voxels. Like in previous studies, they saw a different pattern of activity in piriform cortex for the smell of citrol versus limonene. The blue shows where the activity patterns were different. The new finding is that they also saw differences in piriform activity for the same smell presented with different words. When people smelled menthol, the pattern of activity in the red areas was different depending on whether they saw the word menthol or eucalyptus. And when they smelled eucalyptol, activity in the green areas depended on which word they saw. These results don't definitively show that the same chemical actually smelled different when paired with a different word. Brain areas do a lot of different things, even primary sensory areas, so when you see activity in an area, you can't assume you know what it's doing. That's called the reverse inference problem. But they did trace the effects of word labels deep into the brain's olfactory system and show that they changed its activity, similarly to how smelling two different chemicals changed its activity. Even with this 7 Tesla scanner, they weren't able to find differences in activity between all the different word pairs or even all the different chemicals.
So a lot more research and better imaging techniques will be needed to figure out how the brain takes information about odor molecules and turns it into smells in all their richness and stinkiness. If you want to learn how to do this kind of research or just become a more informed consumer of it, check out our sponsor, Brilliant. They have thousands of interactive lessons to give you a strong foundation in scientific thinking. They're built from the ground up with exercises that help develop your intuition for everything from physics and chemistry to computer programming and AI. Learn data analysis using real-world examples. See why artificial neural networks work so well for things like computer vision and large language models. Whether you're new to math or you just want to brush up on multivariate regression, Brilliant has the tools for you to learn at your own pace. Try Brilliant free for 30 days at brilliant.org IHM. That'll also get you 20% off an annual subscription. That's brilliant.org IHM for 30 days free. Thanks for watching.